Hello, and welcome to the Proactive Caregiving Podcast. As a CPA with over 20 years as an industry accountant, Jessica stepped away from the corporate world to become a full-time caregiver for her mother. Having learned invaluable lessons along the way, she is now here to share those with you and to invite you to join her on this caregiver's journey. Here is your host, Jessica Cannon. Hello, and welcome everybody. I'm here today with a dear friend of mine. You'll get a chance to hear from John Harrell, his story of tragedy to triumph. Tragedy that he has learned to heal from and use to teach others, and use this story as an example of compassion. As I look back into my mom's history, trying to pinpoint when, where, and how her heart was broken, I was not surprised to find specific details around childhood abuse. John is a survivor of childhood physical and emotional abuse. But the cool thing is, is he's taken this type of life and has turned it into greatness. He serves as a chairman of the board of directors for Rachel's Challenge. This is the largest program in the world which focuses on kindness and compassion. And it's named after Rachel Joy Scott, the first child killed at Columbine High School. Rachel's Challenge transforms the lives of 2 million people per year in 40 countries. Now John manages a successful business, he writes a daily inspirational blog, and he is a public speaker. His audience includes corporations, trade associations, college students, and incarcerated children. In 2018, John had a chance to publish his first book, Killing My Father, Then Finding Him which became a number one bestseller on the first day of publication on Amazon. The title alone captured me. I want to introduce you to John Harrow. Welcome on, John. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for, uh, for having me. I'm, I'm honored that you would ask. Absolutely, because like I said, the title alone captured me on this book because I think about how many people are out there in a situation where they're caregiving for maybe a parent that they don't have that relationship with, a good, solid relationship with, that they're not coming from a place of compassion. And so tell me a little bit how this story came about for you, how this book came to be. Sure. So um, as you mentioned, I publish a, a, a blog, and it's now a daily inspiration, a very short, uh, so something that people can start their day with. But when I started it, it would be an occasional blog. About every two to three weeks, I would write something and put it out. And those were those were longer. In April of 2018, I published a blog that I titled Atticus Finch is Dead. Atticus Finch being the <laughs> fictional character from uh, my favorite book and movie of all time, To Kill a Mockingbird. In that blog, I cited a couple of things. One is a Department of Justice study where it was reported that 69% of youth suicides are kids from fatherless homes. Mm -hmm. 75% of rapists are kids from fatherless homes. And then in the next paragraph, I went to a deeper dive about my own family situation, something I had sort of touched on before, but I kept getting encouraged to go deeper. So I did. I said, but what about those of us whose dad came home every night, but we really wished he didn't. And I, and I went into a, uh, telling about, what it was like to live in my home, a fear-filled home where you're literally walking on eggshells, hoping that I don't send my dad into um, you know, a really angry spiral. And, and my mom wasn't really any better. She just wasn't, uh, I wasn't as afraid of her because she was not as physically imposing as my dad was. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I published that, I received a couple of hundred people reaching out to me. Some I knew, some most I didn't know, saying, hey, I grew up the same way, but I always thought I was the only one. Mm -hmm. One girl called me. Now, I hadn't talked to this young woman since middle school, I guess. Um, anyway, she found me through Facebook, and she said, well, I finally stopped crying. And I said, well, I make girls cry all the time, but I haven't even <laughs> talked to you. How could, how could I make you cry? And she said, well, what, I read your blog. And she said, what you don't know is that when we uh, moved away from, from our hometown where we met, so we moved to Dallas, and one day when I was in high school, my dad came home uh, early from work, and he caught me in bed with my high school boyfriend. Mm -hmm. So he kicked him out, and then my dad kicked me out and called me, you know, a, a lot of names, said, my daughter's not going to be the town slut. Get out. Right. You're no longer my daughter. And I said, oh, gosh, it's 
you know, you deserve to be disciplined, but not that. No. That's that was overkill. I'm so sorry. She said, I've tried reaching out to my dad and repairing the relationship with him, but he wants nothing to do with me. Mm. Um, sorry. I mean, I really am because people you carry those hurts with you, mm-hmm. no matter how good that your life may look on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. You're carrying these things with you that are are, are damaging you, to, you know, to your very core in, exactly. inside. So I received so many um, responses to that's the most response I've ever gotten to a blog. I thought if this many people reached out to me and told a little bit of their story and mm-hmm. and and all and how they could relate, I thought there's got to be. 20, 30, 100 times more people exactly. that didn't take time to write because, you know, you, you, you want your, you know, your family as part of your identity from an early, mm-hmm. you know, early on. And you kind of want people to think that your family is just fine. Well, we know better. I mean, there's a lot of right. really messed up families. So I thought, you know, I probably need to go into an even further dive about just, you know, I called the book observations, which, which is what it was, mm-hmm. but also how I was able to, to take you know, the, uh, the damage that, uh, had occurred in my life, the, the trauma, emotional trauma, uh, cause the physical wounds heal, but the emotional trauma stays with you Absolutely. and how I was able to actually flip the script and, and, and forgive my dad and my mom long after they were dead. But, but it, it was just a, a way I thought if I can, if I can show people how I did it, maybe they'll be encouraged to, to try to, to do it as well. Whether you're, you know, the people that have harmed you, whether it's parents, or ex-spouse or whatever, whether they accept it or not, mm-hmm. doesn't matter. It's for you. It's, it, the recovery program is, that recovery is for you. Exactly. So that's where the book came from. And uh, it, I wrote it in three days. It was, <laughs> awesome. it was crazy. Now, yeah. edit, editing took a little longer, but, but that, uh, that's not the fun part. The writing part was actually pretty, pretty easy, to tell you the truth. And I'm sure as you were writing, it was... Uh... One of those, because I know that's what got drew me towards writing is that it, it does become that cathartic process. It's a healing process to get this out. And I love it. It does. And the more I do it, the more, the more I experience that too. As exactly. Well. And, the, and I love the way as you write in the book, you not only have your story, but you connect it and parallel it to other very serious traumatizing situations that have been on the news. Like as you mentioned from Columbine. Uh that those are the areas that people relate to. And that's the thing is when we talk about our, our deep, dark pains, and especially like the woman who is a broken relationship with her father, those are those deep seated relationships that take us through life. And it affects every other relationship that we have, whether it's a personal relationship Uh or professional relationship. That is dead on correct. That's what I experienced myself. And that's why one of the things that those relationships for me is exactly have you, as you wrote in your chapter under fear. And I, to this day, I'm still slowly, but surely coming out of those areas of fear of past experiences. But I like the way you had noted in here that under fear, the idea of a loving family was one I held onto dearly, but as a small child, I lacked the tools to manifest it. I became a performer to feel a modicum of acceptance and sometimes praise. How many of us have experienced those moments in life that have broken our hearts and we become that performer because we seek praise, we seek love, we seek acceptance. I mean, even now in in my life, I'm still seeking that from others and finally accepting that I can love myself. I don't need their acceptance. That's right. You, you, you don't. And, and there's a lot of good that's, that has come out of my background. Really, there is. I mean, number one, I have a, I mean, you've been around me. I have a lightning quick wit. Yes. And, <laughs> and that came from, you know, when you're a kid and people start asking you questions that are personal things, like, you know, mm-hmm. tell me, you know, I'd be like, like a, after a football game or something, like, where's your, where's your parents? Like, well, and I, I, would, I developed this wit which is simply a coping mechanism. It deflects people, gets them off, off the subject, mm-hmm. and then you can move on. And exactly. I became a master at it. So, you know, luck, luckily, fortunately, I didn't lose that. One of my, you know, and I talk about being, in, you know, going through psychotherapy and, and, and I still see the same, same therapist about two or three times a year just to 
just to kind of check in, but I'll, I open up about about that because I want to encourage people to do it. There's nothing there's nothing wrong with you to go mm. seek psychotherapy. In fact, it's it's actually a brave step to take. Mm-hmm. But I was telling my my guy, I said, look, his name's David. I said, I said, David, I'm I'm really kind of concerned that if I get healthy, you know, healthy mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, that I'm not going to be funny anymore. And <laughs> Being funny, humor is the only way I have ever gotten girls to pay attention to me. Okay, mm-hmm. <laughs> because because I'm not Brad Pitt. I'm, but I mean, I'm not un, unattractive. But it's like humor and intelligence are, are are that's all I got. And mainly, and mostly, it's just humor. You know, the other good thing, another really good thing, and what gives me the greatest joy in my life is talking to kids. Mm-hmm. And it, I just go in and tell my story. I, I, you know, I, yes, I speak to incarcerated kids. No, they're not in jail cells, but they're in detention centers, and their days mm-hmm. are planned, scripted. They don't have free reign to get out, get up, and go walk outside on a beautiful spring day and experience that. But the fact that I tell my story about what it was like growing up in my house, and I know that a lot of these kids come from really messed up families, right. and they've done some really bad stuff to get put into the detention center. But they're just, you know, you look in their eyes and they're just kids. I know. They're just young kids. You know, most of them are 12, 13, 14 years old and they're scared to death. Mm-hmm. And so I just go in and tell my story and let my guard completely down. And within two to three minutes of me talking to these kids, all of the age difference and the skin color difference, it all just melts away and they see me as one of them. I become relatable to them. Mm-hmm. And it, it truly, I mean, and that would not have, that that would not have manifested if I had grown up in that happy, normal family that I craved so much as a child. Now, there's no way I could fast forward and see today what I get to do and, and the privilege that that, that that is and how much, you know, again, the inner joy I get from it. I couldn't, I couldn't fast forward and see, and see that. Right. I was just an angry, really angry teenager mm-hmm. that was, you know, wishing for any other existence than what I had. I think I was always that angry child as well. And it wasn't until I'm now uh, later in life as an adult that I'm able to appreciate the upbringing and the character that it helps you build. But in the moment when you're the, in young and in those traumatizing issues and moments trying to live through them, um, as a youth, those circumstances the hope is sucked out of you faster than you can even realize what just happened. And those negative scripts get set in so quickly. And I, Mm -hmm. even more recently, I just had someone point out to me probably like last month talking and and I don't, I'm not opposed to stepping into any form of therapy or support groups. I absolutely love them and think they help people, but some people are opposed to stepping in because they're afraid to show their, their wounds. And yeah, that hope it's, you know, finding it there. It started when they pointed out to me, I'm hearing a negative script. And I didn't even realize, you know, I Uh keep saying these things over and over and over. No wonder it is a negative script. But as an adult, I now have the tools to be able to correct that script and rewrite it. But as a child, and our young youth that get misguided and misdirected so quickly, they don't have that. So they need someone like you to step in and say, you're not the only one. Yeah. And it's, again, I mean, I, I I can't even put into words what what an experience it is. You know, a year ago in July of 2019, I was the morning keynote speaker for a church camp, right? Mm -hmm. It was a three day, two night thing where these kids were bussed in from all over Texas to, uh, to Austin. And it was 400, to 450 black kids mm. and the adult supervisors and counselors, they were in there too. So I was in a, was in a crowd of probably about 550 black people in a, in a church. And I mean, that was so much fun because I had the same experience. I, I literally, I was had the same experience of being relatable to these kids. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever been in a black church or not, but you get a lot of, oh, praise the Lord and amen. <laughs> and, I, and I was getting that from those, from the adults and the kids. But, the, but you, you know that, you know, that, and it's not me. I'm just, I'm grateful that God put me in this position to be able to, to go do that. But you know that you're reaching kids when they start asking you questions. Exactly. And they'll ask you really personal stuff. But I, I think it's wonderful because it means that it's something that's important to them. And if it's helpful to them, then I'm in a spot to, 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 to do that, perhaps. 
Yes. And he absolutely placed you in that position. And I know that just because in your book, you actually point out though, that you had to forgive God as well. And now they mm-hmm. get to see what that looks like even more. I was holding a grudge against him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one thing that I that I learned, and I uh, can't even, you know, the, the, the word grace is tossed around a lot. But I, I got to tell you, I laid into God when I was a teenage kid. I was just dying inside. Mm-hmm. Now, you see me on the outside, and nobody would, nobody would know anything was wrong because— I was an athlete. I was a, you know, I did acted in the school plays. I sang in the choir and, you know, being an athlete and singing in the choir really didn't go too well together, but I didn't care because I enjoyed it. Right. Mm -hmm. But it was an emotional release, which, which allowed me to get some of this out. But I would just lay into him like, you know, if you're so great, why'd you put me in this family? Why can't I be in a family like my friends have, you know, because in my mind, my, my young, idiot mind. I thought that t- that family was like what I'd see on TV, not realizing that's a scripted thing. And, mm-hmm. but they don't, but they, I thought, you know, they don't yell at each other. They don't have tension at the dinner table. They don't, they aren't forced to smile. They aren't told, you know, that they're worthless and not worth a damn, which is what my parents would tell me. I thought there's gotta be, there's gotta be based on something, something that's more normal. But you know, the, the title, which I, I actually, I do love the title. I got to tell you, I'll tell you the story about how, how I came up with it. Mm-hmm. But killing my father is a metaphor for killing the the negative thoughts that were planted firmly in my mind from my dad and my mom both. I said father because as a man I, I'm I more relate to the, to the to the father right, right. to the dad and and then then finding him was was the spiritual piece in the in the book where I found the true character of who God is and I realized that when I was dying inside as a young person, he was weeping right along with me. Mm-hmm. He wasn't, and, he, and thank goodness he doesn't hold a grudge because I mean, I, I laid into him pretty hard. What I also learned, Jessica, is that he can take a punch. Mm-hmm. He's not like, he's not like a human. He doesn't hold a grudge against me. I mean, I'm getting teary. I just talking about this, mm-hmm. but he doesn't hold a grudge against me because I poured my heart out to him. And now I realize he was hurting too. Exactly. He didn't take it. He didn't take it out on me or punish me. And I was a little nervous that he might, of course, because you're going, okay, if he's God, he can turn me into a, you know, a vapor in a, in a split second, but he didn't. No. So, and it, it's a lifelong quest now to, to, you know, learn and study and, and, and really impart the character of who God is into my heart, not just my head, but into my heart. When you exactly. can connect the, the intellect to the, to the emotion then, then, then it becomes part of who you are. Then you see things through a different prism, if you will. I absolutely agree with that because for so long, growing up in that same type of an angst, teenager angst world, and then taking that into my adult life and trying to go through a career in that mentality, I, I didn't realize how closed off I was and how much it really affected me until I was able to learn how to drop out of my mind, out of my head and that analytical mind to let go, not completely turn away from intellectual ways of life, but to drop out of that mindset and drop into the heart. And that's not always uh-huh. easy. It, there were some things I didn't want to look at. There were some things I didn't want to feel through, but it wasn't until I did that things changed. It's like when you said, thank goodness that God isn't, he doesn't hold a grudge because I, I feel like no sooner that you said that I was picturing him with his hand on my head and it's a little kid trying to (laughs) throw swings at his waist. And he's like, calm child, calm. (laughs) But I didn't reach that sense of calm until an adult. And even now I can say that it, it makes a huge difference of going from the head to the heart. It does. And, and, but, but again, you carry these things with you mm-hmm. if you don't find a way to work through them and I, and you can't just, you can't just wish it away. And mm-hmm. I learned that I thought I could, I really thought I could, but that's just how naive and unprepared for adult life that I was. Yeah. And we but, can't uh, wish that kind you know? of stuff away and it's not going to go away because those are the things that we don't know in the moment that 
he's instilling on deliberately instilling these things inside of us to help build uh-huh. resilience and strength along the way. And it takes that going through the darkness, the dark night of the soul to go from one side and make it through to the other side. That's right. And you mentioned resilience. I wrote about that in the book. Um, and I, and I, I speak on this too. It's like, you know, as a, as a parent, I have two, two boys that are now 27 and 25, but when they were growing up, I had to let them hurt. I had to let them fall flat on their butts and hurt Mm -hmm. and grieve and figure out that they can pick themselves up because that will prepare them for something else that may happen in their life. But it gives them, it teaches them resilience and gives them confidence that they can. When you think about my friend, Daryl Scott, Rachel's dad, his life was turned upside down in an instant. One, Mm -hmm. one day they've got five kids going off to school, very, you know, elementary, middle, and high school, Mm -hmm. and then that at the end of that very day, he's lost a child. Mm -hmm. But if he he hadn't been imbued with a strong character and a a strong, you know, he did have a strong faith, but he also had resilience. He was just mentally tough, and not to say he didn't grieve, because he did. In fact, you know, 21 years later, he still grieves his daughter. I don't think that you ever get over that. I don't, no. I don't know. I can't really empathize because I don't have a shared experience, right. but he does think about these things. And, and, but again, if we, if we raise kids in the participation trophy generation, as I call it, and, mm-hmm. and we just make things easy on kids so that they don't hurt. I, you know, as a parent, I get it. You don't want your kid to hurt. Right. No. But no you got to let them go through it. Yes. You've got to let them go through it because that's how they learn that they will get over it. I mean, I, I remember one of my sons, you know, his uh, girl broke up with him and his heart, his, he was heartbroken. And I said, I wish I could take the pain away, but I can't. Right. You just have got to grieve and work through it. And I promise you, it will get better. You don't see it now, but I promise you it will get better. And, and <laughs> what I didn't tell him was, and he'll listen to this, uh, if it's, it's, uh, it's, it's dropped, but what I didn't tell him was, your dad knows a lot about rejection from women, okay? <laughs> 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 I've had my share and 10 other people's shares as well, but, but you know, you just pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and Keep go try again, going. right? Yep, try, try again. <laughs> That's why it's a saying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But the, the book title, so I was toying with the idea of writing it on a, on a weekend, and I um, was t- I, writ- I wrote down a few titles I thought might be okay, and one was like, like I'm No Longer Afraid or something like that, mm-hmm. and, and yeah, I, it just didn't resonate. So I will never forget, after that weekend, when I was bouncing this off a couple of my friends, talking about what I wanted to write about and how I would do it, and, and I woke up, and at 5... 40 in the morning on that Monday morning, I just had this little real short conversation. So, okay, God, if you want me to do this, you got to give me a title. And immediately that title popped in my head <laughs> and I'm going, I like it. It just clicks. I it love just that. works. It does. And I'm like, dang it. Now I got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to follow through and keep my, keep my commitment. Okay. I'll, I'll do it. But I, that's where the title came from. It's just one of those, and rarely are prayers, in, you know, instantaneously answered true, like that one. True. But that one sure was. <laughs> well, you know, it goes along with that whole if ask and you shall receive. You asked and he gave it, so <laughs> you had to follow through. And I'm so glad you followed through because this is yet another area in here that really spoke to me. He and I love this because as I read through your book, I can see how he was speaking through you to connect to so many others because um, let's see just on the third page, I think it's still even in the beginning of your preface. You had this area several years ago, I was having a conversation with a client who is a brilliant scientist. At one point we Uh started talking about faith. My client said, you know, as a scientist, I'm really sort of an atheist. I believe in what I can demonstrate sign demonstrate scientifically. And I'm not sure that includes a deity. I replied, okay, I get that. But consider this, have you ever experienced love? And of course he replied. Then I asked him to write out the scientific formula for love. I, I love that because exactly. I, I, that, came from, that came from God because I am not that good, Jessica, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not that good. It wasn't planned. It just, it just came out. But that is 
And he pulled it out of you and put it in this, you put it into this book because, and you finished it off. That's what faith looks like. And, and for me, that's, you know, stepping into a new role in life, stepping out of going through the transition of dropping from the analytical and intellectual mind into the heart. It was that transformational process that he, I feel that God brought about in me as he called me to be a caregiver. But then Mm -hmm. looking at your story and thinking through this, it just made me wonder how many people are out there that are going through these moments. And yes, we do have to experience these moments. I don't think there's one person out in this whole entire world that ever lived a life without any problems or issues or strife of any kind. I just, that's how we learn and grow. And Mm -hmm. as a parent, I know that God step, stands by and he's there with every, with us every step of the way as we go through those trials and tribulations, but he's doing it for our own good. And this fact that I didn't see my faith grow until I stepped into that role, I wasn't coming as a scientist kind of mindset, but at the same time, it's just amazing how this works. And I'm, I'm so glad that you put that there. Do you feel that yourself? I mean, as a, as a writer and as a blogger and inspiring others, do you feel like you're reaching those scientific analytical minds? I do because we have, we all have a common thread there. And that is the thread of, of the emotion. You know, when, if you go back to, you go back to the original school system in the United States of America, it was founded by Horace Mann. And in the original school system, public school system, they taught the head, the hand, and the heart. They taught, you know, the an- the analytical, the intellect, if you will, the uh, emotion, and also the application. Mm-hmm. Now we teach to a test, but that but that doesn't mean that uh, that humans have evolved out of emotion. It's still there. True. Sometimes we're taught, you know, as men especially, we're you know we're taught to turn it off. You've probably heard, I'm sure, mm-hmm. maybe. Maybe your husband's heard that you know men don't cry. Well, sure they do. Right. <laughs> you know, of course, there's they nothing do. unmanly about it. You know, you don't want to walk around like a blubbering idiot all the time. But but you know, the, but <laughs> emotion is what drives us. Emotion, the emotional side of our brain is where the, the create the creative spirit comes from. We all have it. Every mm-hmm. one of us has it. But exactly. I do. I hear people say, hey, "I don't have a creative bone in my body." Of course you do. Have you ever had an original idea? Well, yeah. Okay, that's creating something. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. you have it. You're just tamping it down. Let it flow. Get quiet. Listen, and maybe something comes. Maybe it doesn't. But just because it doesn't once doesn't come. Maybe an idea didn't flow to you one time. Doesn't mean it's not going to. Now is not forever. Right. So it's. But you can reach the analytical types, and you can reach the people that that you know get in the side of the brain. Do you feel up? Well, sure. Everybody has right. Everybody mm-hmm. except the so- sociopath, right? But mm-hmm. uh, but they have it, so you can you can get into that part of their of their you know psychological and physiological makeup, and and you can connect with them. Connection is a, a word I, you hear me use a lot. It's different from anything else. When you actually connect with somebody, you let your guard down, and then when you do that, that encourages others to let their guard down as well. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I can't tell you how many times. I always feel feel sorry for my, uh, or feel some compassion for my my seatmate on an airplane because they're going to get an earful, you know. Because <laughs> I, I like your place there for people. a reason. I like, <laughs> I like I like getting their story, so like in a three and a half four hour flight from here to Los Angeles, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I've had people tell me their entire stories and and, and of some horrific things that have mm-hmm. happened to them, but that's just because I'm willing to let my guard down and mm-hmm. be completely open with people. And it encourages them to as well. So instead of just having a casual conversation about, you know, the your favorite sports team or what's going on in the political world or, or the whatever, the, or the the weather in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. you can actually have a deeper connected conversation with exactly. people and really connect. And so um, it's just different. It's a different way to look at it. But I think everybody's got it in them. We just spend too much time putting up facades, as I call it, trying to look look cool. We got our act together. Everything's good, but 
you know, it, 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 it isn't always. You said it earlier, you know, life is hard. I mean, mm-hmm. life is challenging. You're going, you, no one gets out of this thing without having no. some real challenges thrown at them. And exactly. it's just, I always say, you know, life, life will throw you curveballs. You got to learn to hit them too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You got to learn how to knock them out of the park. And that's where, uh, yeah. and I like also the way you also point out, uh, people everywhere say they want unity and diversity. But mm-hmm. when we have, you know, situations where we're able to create unity and still accept the diversity, we seem to step away from it. And our hearts, you know, our, our broken hearts play into that, that proverbial broken heart play into that. Yep. Did you have a, a, a favorite chapter, by the way? I loved the fear because that seems to be the theme for me currently. That seems to be the theme in my life where I'm overcoming my own personal childhood and Mm -hmm. adolescence fears that have held me back in life. And I did Mm -hmm. a similar thing like you. I felt like I started to receive calling from God of what he wanted me to do. And those voices started to come through and the, the heart started to kind of come into it and started pulling me in a certain direction. But then I cut going back to that comfort zone for me, that comfort zone included hanging on to the identity of who I was and the identity that I thought I had because of my life experiences and having to learn that those, those times in my life and what I identified with were not who I am. And so accepting and understanding that fear and where it came from and why it was so deep seated and how to get, let it go. That's where the, I guess my, the windows of my mind finally started to open up and fresh air coming in and letting go of all the old in the past and being able to live in the moment. So the chapter of fear really, it really spoke to me. And that's great. I that's great. actually went and spat. In fact, one of the other things, cause I started going through and I was like, yep, I get that. Yep. I get that. I can totally relate to that. <laughs> um, because you also, and I marked down, you had to put at five, I took on the job of keeping the house clean. I vacuumed, dusted and did laundry, took out the trash and any other job I noticed needed attention. I loved the short lived praise I received, but imagine my confusion when my dad remained the same guy. That is something I totally lived. I, felt like I was growing up as Cinderella. I had to clean in the house and do the chores, which yes, we want our kids to have chores. We want them to, um, that's another way for them to learn their values and morals and, and being part of a family and all what it means. But at the same time, it, that moment of not being able to do go out and do what my friends were doing and being part of the in crowd and being acknowledged and accepted as the cool person I thought I could be that I wanted to be. And then seeing that no matter what I did at home, it didn't make any difference. They were still just Uh expecting the same thing day after day after day. It, I don't know. It just gave me that. I don't know the idea that, I, that's what started to drop that seed in that I'm not enough. And I know a lot of women get stuck in that I'm not enough area. Uh. And it's just, that's why when I read through that, I was like, oh, wow, this is, it is powerful to hear it not only coming from someone else, but from a man that experienced the same thing or similar things and had that same amount of fear. And it's almost a freeing feeling when I realize, and it's, the, I think other people and even the teenagers you speak to that they have that moment. I'm not alone. I'm not the only one. Yeah. So uh, again, as a, I, I couldn't have seen it at the time, but um, all this stuff goes into making me who I am. And it, mm-hmm. I have a, the ability to go out and share that story and I do it readily. I just, I love, I love any opportunity I had to talk to young people. I love doing it. Yeah. You know, college kids, elementary school kids, you name it. I, I, cause I can always find a way to, to connect with them always. Mm-hmm. And, and it's interesting too, because the first few visions that I started that the Holy spirit started to put on my mind was me speaking in front of high school students. And I mm-hmm. thought there is no way in the world. There is no way because they don't want to hear my story. My story is not going to impact them the way it impacted me. And I, out of fear, 
I talked myself out of it. But here it is. And this was like maybe four or five years ago. And now here it mm-hmm. is that I finally have learned to shed that fear and go in the direction and just take that leap of faith. But it takes finding yeah, people it, like you and putting them in my path and seeing how you lived your life and how you overcame your troubles and your trials. Good, because because I encourage you to revisit that one. You know, the 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 the, the self talk, which I, I wrote something about recently about self talk. You know, you you're you've got to be careful what you say to yourself. Because mm-hmm. you're talking to yourself all the time. Exactly. And Jessica, there's two voices competing for our attention all day long. All mm-hmm. of us are the same in that respect. Yep. Two voices. One's good and one's not good. Exactly. Don't listen to the one that's not good. And, you know, just listen to the one that is encouraging. It's in nudging. It's prodding you. It's, it's maybe even pushing you a little bit, convicting you to go where you're where you are, 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 are wanting to go. And, and going to talk to high school kids, yeah, they'll relate to your story. They, they will completely because they're living it. You know, when exactly. we are unique, but we're not all that unique in our experiences. And so, the, but the value that you bring is going to be evidenced by the, by the responses that you get from young people. And there's nothing more gratifying than making an impact on a young person that you just met for a few minutes, you know? I believe it. I feel it now. And not only because it's like when you become, as you become a teacher and you step into that role, not only you are you getting better as you teach? They're teaching you in return. Mm-hmm. You're understanding. That's right. So, and then the second chapter that I loved was the chapter on forgiveness, because I agree forgiveness is hard. And I can say time and time again, I've been in so many different scenarios that I have said, I forgive them because I know it's not good for me. It's not good for my heart and I need to move on, but it never fails. The forgiveness is not in that moment. It's a word. It's not felt through and through until much later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In fact, with some people that I need to that I need to forgive, maybe in the moment. Sometimes I use a different F word, which I won't use here. But, <laughs> but uh, yes, it's, it's not automatic. I mean, it took it took it took actively. You know, and I write about this actively practicing gratitude. I've always exactly. been I've always been upbeat. I've always been been thankful for stuff, but actively practicing gratitude, really focusing on what you are grateful for in the moment and really experiencing that at your your deepest levels, that does change the biochemistry in your brain mm-hmm. and it allows you it allowed me to see my parents for who they truly were, flaws and all, and was able to be understanding and compassionate toward them and was able to Forgive them for their you know, shortcomings or their inability to, to to parent. I mean, they really weren't even as good as a married couple. Mm. But you know, we don't get we don't get to choose uh, who you know who our parents are. Nope. God chooses that, and He has a reason for it. So, uh, but but even beyond that, you know, you can't even connect the spiritual part of the of the equation until you really get your head around it. But again, I encourage people to. Write three things down in the morning. Just write them down. If it's something new, you write three things down that you're you're grateful for, and think about them during the day. And uh, I do this with these with, with you know kids. I say, like, look, practicing gratitude. And I get that you cannot even get up and walk outside on your own because you're in a lockdown. Mm-hmm. But think of it like this: you can take a deep breath of fresh air, and it's not going to poison you. We take it for granted. Air is plentiful. It's free. Mm-hmm. But if you're a uh, if you're an infant child in Syria and your leader has just gas bombed you, yeah. every breath you take is setting your lungs on fire. You want to exactly. die. So it's not something to take for granted. Water. There's usually a water fountain mm-hmm. in 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 or around the room. I'm talking in. I was like, go. You know, you can walk over there and get a drink of water, and you're not going to be poisoned. Not true if you live in certain parts of Flint, Michigan, where the water true. is so toxic with with uh, mercury. That it will put, in fact, it's killed, it's killed children in Flint, Michigan. This is right here in the United States of America. So right. be grateful for that because you won't live a couple of days, past a couple of days without water. So be grateful for that and think about these things. And as you do, as your mind you know, evolves, 
all of a sudden you'll start seeing even more things to be grateful for. You'll you'll even look at trees differently. You know, you'll look at <laughs> yes. little birds flying around differently. That I mean, it sounds so true. crazy and stupid, but it's true. You will see things through a different lens or a different prism, Absolutely. if you will, when you, when you actively do this. And the thing is, it's available to anybody. You don't have to mm-hmm. sign up for some self-help course. No. Just write it down, you That's know, or even right. if you don't want to write it down, just, just think about it and then think about it during the day. And then you find yourself noticing these things during the day. It, it, it takes about three to four weeks before it really starts to hit right. you. And then it does. And, and it feeds on itself. It just, it just grows like a snowball coming down from an avalanche. It just gets bigger and bigger exactly. and bigger and you can't stop it at that point. Well, and that's the thing with any new routine that you're trying to implement, it takes at least 21 days before it can become a habit. And it once you drop right. it, it, that habit is broken faster than it took you to build it, which is why the consistency is so important. And that's it's that's right. amazing that you said that because I was just having a conversation with my husband probably yesterday even is that once I realized that if I try to maintain a mindset of gratitude, then if I was in that moment of gratitude, I wasn't in the moment of anger or fear or doubt or worries or anxiety. And I could look at the world in a different way. And I was seeing that gratitude was helping me to appreciate the world I am in the time that Uh I'm in this world and how much more I have to go, how much I have to give and how much I can connect to others and help them along the way. It just, it made me feel so much better overall that it's like, why didn't I do this sooner? Well, it's that (laughs) programming, that negative programming that starts early in life. And we don't know to break that. We don't even know it's there until someone else comes into your life later on. Mm-hmm. That's, that's kind of how it's then, happened for Then it's like, where, where has this been all my life, right? Exactly. And then, <laughs> and then in addition to that, that gratefulness helps me actually feel and understand the forgiveness and, and understand the other person that I was struggling to be able to forgive. Now, mm-hmm. coming from that mindset of gratefulness, it's like, oh, now I know what it means. I understand where they were coming from. They had their intentions, whether they were good, bad, or indifferent, those were their intentions at the time. Maybe they didn't know better. I can forgive them. I can let them go for whatever it was. And then I can move on in life in a better, positive, healthier way. Because that's another one you have in here is healing the heart to heal the mind. Uh And that's what the gratitude Uh does. Somebody uh, wrote me and said that, um, on, on the on the chapter on forgiveness, they said that uh, they had met. Cause I write in there, you got to be able to forgive yourself too. Mm-hmm. And p- this person wrote me, and and he said, I never even considered that. But it's like again, it goes back to some of the self talk and beating yourself up, and and you make a mistake and you hold on to it too long. I mean, everybody, I would get. I would get a whipping and a berating for spilling water, having an accident where you, right. you can't live perfectly. But it makes you, again, you walk on eggshells. It's like you forgive yourself for things you've done in the past that you don't do anymore. Forgive yourself for mistakes you've made. Don't keep beating yourself up. Really, really, mm-hmm. if you're honestly, say you've offended somebody and you ask their forgiveness with a, with a with pureness in your heart, and they then they forgive you or they don't either way don't beat yourself up self right. up over it going forward if your intentions your motives are pure that you that you seek their forgiveness and then that way you can actually let it go but mm-hmm. you, but people have got every person i encounter has got some things that they need to forgive themselves for yes that's true i mean emotionally again just like when none of us have gone through life without any errors or any issues that we've had to learn and grow from there's Mm -hmm. because of those. And in fact, those were the moments that I, once I finally started to become more self-aware of this, I was able to look back and forgive myself because at the age of 20, what did I know at 20? So the, the, (laughs) the decisions I made at 20, I could forgive myself because I just was inexperienced in life in general. Sure. And that's That's right. And that's one of the things that helps. I recognize. laugh because at 20, I thought I knew it all. Of course, we all do. We all do. And that's why I love my, my oldest son, who is now 24. And when he was at that 
19, 20, 21. I'm so many times that I just said, Oh, just wait, just wait. And other, <laughs> other parents around me that had their children that were older, they would tell me just wait, he'll get there. He'll get there. And now that he's 24 and he's an adult life, the world of the, you know, living, working, going to school full time, he's still finishing his degree and mm-hmm. other areas of life were happening. I'm like, do you still like adulthood? <laughs> Are you still enjoying it? Is this still what you thought you couldn't wait to get to? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> childhood is actually a pretty good time if you're, uh, you know, if you if you, if, you, if, if unless you're in it, right? Right, exactly. So, do one of the other things I wanted to ask is, do you ever choose a word of the year? Um, I never have done that. No. Okay. Well, I just started doing this about three years ago. And this is yet again, another thing as I'm flipping through the book and I'm going page by page, I had just decided earlier this week before I even looked at your book that my word for the remainder of this crazy 2020 and going into Mm -hmm. 2021 in the, the intent of making positive change in my life, my word for next year was going to be authenticity. Oh, wow. Cool. Yes. So I get your book and I go start going through. And again, (laughs) one of the paragraphs starts off, I like to imagine God is laughing at this scene. And as you go through, and I'm thinking, how many times has he said to me and tried to place certain things on my heart and being true to myself (laughs) and that authentic (laughs) self and learning to be a better writer. And it really came down to just being more authentic. Mm-hmm. That is that is a great <laughs> word, actually. And yeah, even even though I watched that scene in uh, Meet the Falkers so many times, I'm sorry, Meet the Parents so many times, I still laughed. I was laughing as I was writing it down, uh, describing that that scene because he just had to be perfect. It was a great great scene, but it worked for that authentic chapter, all being authentic because people want that. Mm-hmm. But then. We live in a world of Botox and filters and everything yeah, else, know. right? I know. I fall, <laughs> I've fallen into that boat too. But, you know, and that's, <laughs> that's where when you ask that question, do you think God wants us to be real with him? Well, not only does he want us to be real with him, I think every other person out in the world wants realness, but they don't know how to present it and to show realness. Sure, because if you see the real me, Maybe you won't like me. Exactly. And we all want to be liked, you know. Exactly. That's the thing with, with kids. When you talk to kids, they can see right through you. You can't BS them. You've got to no. tell them things as they really are because they can see if you're just giving them a, you know, a line or something. Mm-hmm. They can see right through you. And so that's why you just got to be willing to, to let your guard down with them. And if you do, you'll get rewarded and they'll get rewarded. They'll get, right. uh, they'll get what they're looking for. Right. So what are your next plans with this book? Are you continuing to speak to children as every opportunity you get? I, I am now because of coronavirus. I'm not able to go to the facilities because of the, you know, the mm. lockdown and all, and they're having to, to manage it differently. But, but we'll get, you know, we will get through that. Um, we just will. Mm-hmm. And so I'm always looking for opportunities, but most of them are going to be virtual right now. I don't, I don't necessarily like that as much because, it's just, I don't know, being being in front of a live audience, just, you know, I'm a performer. It just feeds me, right? And this, you know, this will pass, and I'll be back out there. So in the interim, I just write the Daily Inspiration. I record videos every week and put them out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and probably a few more places I can't think of, and just continue, continue to create. I've got other creative ideas I'm working on, and I got some time now because I'm working from home like the rest of the free world. Right. You know? right. And while the others are working from home, how can they find your book? Where do they need to go to find your book? Sure. It is on Amazon.com, Kindle and paperback both. It is it is there. And I encourage people, there's, a, there's an email address in the back of the uh, book. If they read it, they like it, don't like it, whatever. Send me, send me some feedback because I love hearing from readers and I get it's still selling well, and I still get, oh, probably an email, maybe ever ever couple of weeks or so. It's, it's tapered off some, but but I still I still hear from people, and I've got, I think, eighteen reviews, all five stars. I'm proud of I am proud of that. You know, it's like that's <laughs> that's that's uh, you know, that's 
<clears throat> and I hate to say it this way, but that's validation that it really does. Yes, it I does know. what I intended it for it to do and helps, helps people. So I know I'm very grateful mean. for that. Yeah. As a writer, we, no matter what, no matter how confident you ever get to be, we still want the validation. So that's, that's awesome. It's true. And, and, and the funny thing is like, like with my Facebook, and I, I'm on Facebook almost daily with either something inspirational or something funny. I like, to, I love to make people yes, laugh. So I'll put something up, but I never really count the likes. It's just not, that's not important to me. It's just, it's a way to create something that, that can either inspire or again, give you a moment to laugh at something, me and, me and my uh, silliness. But, uh, but I don't care if I get two likes or 200. It does, it's yeah. not, I don't need that kind of validation, which I feel like that's, that's personal growth for me. Okay. <laughs> uh, me too. Uh, when I first started, it was like I would put something out there and I expected to see a like right away, especially from all the beyond family and friends. And even when I didn't see that. I thought, you know what? It's okay because I know the one person who liked it or the one person who sees it that needs to see it, it's there for them mm-hmm. and not have to worry, you know, work right for the one and not worry about the many. So what is that the name is of exactly your, right. What is the name of your blog? How can they find your blog? Sure. It is www.seeking-grace.com. S E E K I N G dash G R A C E dot com. And I also have a website. It's John Harrell Author, two R's, two L's, John Harrell Author dot com. And so the, the blog is loaded on there every day automatically for me. Nice. Um, there's some videos I've done from anything from CBS New York to right here in um, We Are Austin a couple of years ago and, nice. and all. So those are, those are on there and contact info as well. And I love to hear from people. I really do. I always tell people, said, you know, if you write me, I will get back to you. It may take me a week or two, but I will answer every email and every every phone call. So that's that's awesome, and thank you for doing that because you definitely have become a lifeline for many. Well, I try. <laughs> I really do try, <laughs> and, that's and I all we can uh, do. and I enjoy I enjoy doing it. So uh, as long as I've got a, a breath in me, I'll be, I'll keep keep going. When that individual person says. Uh, their hopes and dreams are smashed and they have this, I can't mentality or I can't, and then fill in the blank, whatever it is, then I encourage mm-hmm. the readers and I encourage the listeners out there to get this book. And it is telling you if you're, if you're one that says, Oh, I don't read a lot. It is a short read. It is a nice book that you can get to the point. And that's, I mean, he hits a lot of serious matters and he gets directly to the point so well, thank you and I, I did keep it short on purpose i kept it short because i really want men to read it too yeah so it it, it, it encourages people to uh to pick it up and and you can get through it it'll take about take probably yeah, probably an hour or so it's just designed as observations but designed to make you think without any judgment at all I wrote from no no judgmental standpoint in, in any chapter. I even have a chapter on judgment. That's one of my favorite chapters in there. Well, and that is yet another area that I've had to learn as in stepping into the caregiving role is to come from that place of compassion and not so much judgment. And mm-hmm. lo and behold, that's anger starts to kind of melt away when I can come out of that judgmental mindset as well. So you have so much in this book, this this very compact book, you have so much information in there that has been so beneficial for me. Thank you so much for coming Great. Here today and sharing it with us. Well, thank you. I feel honored that you asked me to do it. And I, uh, again, I, I hope this has been helpful to your listeners and, and encourage them. If they do read the book, reach out to me. I'd love to hear from them. Definitely. So there you go, everybody. My friend, John Harrell, and his wonderful book, Killing My Father and Finding Him. I hope this gave you more food for thought, and until next time, be proactive. Take care, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We really hope you've enjoyed this episode. To learn more about proactive caregiving and to hear other episodes of this podcast, please visit www.jessicalizelcannon.com. This podcast is produced by Cannon Light Media, LLC, www.cannonlightmedia.com. Music provided by Chris Paradise.